On May 19th of 1967, during his 81st combat mission over North Vietnam, Captain Eugene Red McDaniel and his navigator were shot down and taken prisoner. Captain McDaniel spent the next six years as a POW, during which time he was repeatedly tortured by his captors. His inspiring and somewhat gut-wrenching story is told in his 1975 book, Scars and Stripes. When the war ended, he was able to come home in May, uh, no it wasn't, it was March of 1973. And then he resumed his naval career. He eventually became the commanding officer of the carrier USS Lexington. That's certainly a high post in the United States Navy. Then in 1982, he retired from active service. Since then, he has founded and led the American Defense Institute located in Alexandria, Virginia. He's intimately familiar with the case histories of thousands of abandoned POWs and MIAs. And for those of you who don't know the terminology, POW is pr prisoner of war, MIA, missing in action. And we will use that term throughout this interview. Captain McDaniel is one of their most outspoken spokesmen, one of their champions. And he's a severe critic of the U.S. government's POW MIA policy. He's convinced that American servicemen from the Vietnam War are still being held captive in Southeast Asia and in Russia. Captain McDaniel, we're, we're glad you made it home. Now, I know that you were initially convinced that there were no more POWs or MIAs left behind in Southeast Asia, and then you changed your mind. What was it that caused you to change your mind? Well, Jack, when I came home in 1973, I believe we all had come home. But in 1981, I was Navy Marine Corps liaison to the United States Congress. And one of my jobs was to take members of Congress to the Pentagon for briefings from the boat people who had seen POWs in captivity. The boat people meaning the people who were fleeing from Vietnam from, yes. from, Vietnam, from the communist control there. Yeah. And one trip to the Pentagon, taking some congressmen, I saw a photograph taken by satellite. It showed what appeared to be two compounds, an inner compound and an outer compound in the country of Laos, taken by satellite. The inner compound showed men of tall shadow. The State Department will tell you today the men of uh, non-Asian shadows. In tall shadows, yes. taller than the Asians. Uh, the outer compound showed men of smaller stature. So they were Asians in the outer compound, and you felt that they were Caucasians or possibly Americans? The outer compound were probably South Vietnamese re-education camps. I the inner compound, American POWs. Okay. Because of that photograph, I had second thoughts for the first time about leaving prisoners there. Now, this was 1981. 1981. You were still in the Navy. Yes. And I was signed in Congress. On Capitol Hill. Okay. And Ronald Reagan came to office in 1981, January. Because of that photograph that turned me around, Ronald Reagan put a raid on the ground called the Namorod Mission to get photographs of those two compounds. So he thought enough of it to put a raid on the ground. So it was a very compelling picture. I see. All right, now, later on, you decided, I think four years later, that not only were there men there, but that our own government had abandoned them and had no intention of doing anything about that. Uh, that's a, a jump. We've jumped to a whole new level here. Perhaps you could get into some of the reasons that, that brought you to that. Well, in 1981, I learned that they were there. And I said, Ronald Reagan's in the White House, uh, a, a man of integrity, and certainly Ronald Reagan would get it done. Well, for the next four years, I believed that. I thought covertly they were going to get it done and bring our prisoners home. But in 1985, I came to the sad conclusion, Jack, that this government had no intention of bringing prisoners out of Southeast Asia. And I spoke out publicly for the first time. And when I did, two days later, I get a phone call from the White House to my home late at night from a Colonel Richard Childers from the National Security Council. And the purpose of the call was to intimidate me not to say again publicly what I'd said earlier. Did they threaten you with uh, some sort of reprisals? You were out of the Navy by then. Well, I knew the Colonel, yeah. and, but the Colonel told me that I briefed the President daily on the POW issue, and I said to the Colonel, do you think we have prisoners in Southeast Asia? And he said, and I quote, you damn right we do. I said, well, Colonel, when do we get them home? He said two to three years. Well, that was 1985 in the summer, where now the, the winter of 1992, nothing's been done. All right, how many men do you think were left behind? No one knows, but uh, we had testimony recently on Capitol Hill before the Select Committee that said they were tracking 1,600 between 1973 and 1992 by radio intercept. Uh, how many of those are living? We don't know. How many died 10 years ago? How many died five years ago? How many died last week? We don't know, but some are living as we speak. All right, let's go back to the time that you were freed, 1973. 
uh, I think there were 591 Americans returned by the Vietnamese. What were some of the estimates that places like the Pentagon or the newspapers or so, weren't there many more that were felt to have been there? Well, according to the New York Times, we asked for 5,000 people at the end of the war. Believing we had reason to believe there were 5,000 men in captivity. According to Pentagon figures, we asked for 3,733. That's the Pentagon of the United States asked the Vietnamese to return yes. 3,733. They returned 591. Yes, and that was after Richard Nixon made a secret promise of $4.3 billion to the Vietnamese in exchange for prisoners. The Vietnamese were skeptical of that promise, so they kept collateral, meaning prisoners. But that offer was not even known to U.S. Congress for two years. In 1975, Sonny Montgomery and the Gerald Ford went to Hanoi and learned for the first time that Nixon had made a secret promise two years earlier. So it's no wonder Nixon did not get the money appropriated. Uh, Congress did not, uh, was not aware of it. Well, on April 12, 1973, after 591 of us came home, and this was the Vietnamese list, not the one we asked for, but the one they gave us. And I was in, included in that group. I was in the second group. Well, on April 12th, some 12 days after we were released, the State Department, in conjunction with the White House, declared them all dead. That became policy. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Pentagon itself had said there were 3,733. The Vietnamese returned 591. That means over 3,000 didn't come back. Didn't come back. And it was just a few days later that the State Department said they were all dead. Declared them all dead, yes, that's correct. Uh, that sounds a little bit unusual. Well, <laughs> to deal with Watergate politically, Richard Nixon declared them all dead. To oh, I see. This is during the period that, that what Nixon was having his Watergate exactly. troubles. I see. And then, but saying they're dead doesn't make them dead. And it was after that the report started coming out of Caucasians being seen in a prison environment. And today we have 1,435 live sightings of groups of Caucasians in captivity. Well, we have a. We have a clipping of uh, uh, on our board here. We have uh, one of the newspaper clippings of many that talks about the fact that there were live sightings. And I think this one was in June of 1989. Uh, no, that's, that's the picture. Uh, well, why don't we talk about that okay. picture, Red? This picture here is a very compelling picture. That picture came to me in November of 1990. It shows three men that were shot down in 1966, 1969, 1970. It represents... Now, it, it doesn't... It doesn't really clearly show three, but there is a third man behind in the center of yes, it, I guess. Yes. It, it's a little fuzzy at that point, but you can certainly see at least two. But and that picture uh, came to me in November 1990. The Pentagon got the picture in June of 1995, months before I got it. I got it because my organization had offered a reward for prisoners. And because of that photograph that came to me, I sat on it because the families asked me not to go public with it. Well, why would the families do that? Because they had a, uh, an effort going in the private sector thinking to buy their prisoners out. And they thought that if there was too much publicity yes. that somebody might kill their man, their, yes. their, their loved ones. All right, so, so you held the picture for five months. I held it for longer, until July 16th, 1991. Well, I what persuaded about you? Eight months. What persuaded you to finally release it? Well, on July the 12th, the family members depicted in that picture took the picture to the Pentagon, who saw the picture for the first time. That afternoon, the Pentagon faxed that picture to Hanoi. To Hanoi? Yes. And two days later, I get a phone call from a Reuter News Agency journalist who had seen a copy of that picture, and I decided if it was good enough for the Vietnamese to see, it was good enough for the American people to see, and I wanted the American people to monitor how the Pentagon would predictably begin to discredit that photograph. Well, and they did. Absolutely. Uh, how about some of the... De I, I saw the photo in the local newspaper where I live, and, and I said to myself, uh, this is interesting, and then all of a sudden, bang, the, they were discrediting it. They were saying it's a, it's a made-up photo, and it... it, it it has no uh, credibility and so forth, but uh, hasn't the photo been looked at very carefully by the family members? It's been looked at very carefully. The photograph still stands. They say it's been doctored, but the Pentagon released some fake photographs that they found of people who nobody said were POWs, and they're saying those pictures are hoax, and by association they, they just say this picture's a hoax, but so this picture is valid. It's well, not you can a, name the three men in the picture, I guess. Yes. John Robertson, uh, Larry Stevens, and uh, Albert Lundy. I see. And with that picture came three sets of fingerprints. Oh, I, I've heard you talk about this. Uh, uh, I'm going to call you Red. Red, I've heard you talk about this. This is, this is somewhat unbelievable. Tell us about the fingerprints. Well, 18 months ago, all three sets of those men had fingerprints in their record, service records. We, with the picture came photographs and fingerprints. We took the fingerprints to the Pentagon to compare the fingerprints that we had out of Asia with those in their service records, and they all had been removed, all three sets. From their service records? Yes. So we decided we'd go back uh, to the, where they were born. 
uh, in California in two cases, went to the place to hospitals where they were born, there were no fingerprints on the birth certificate. It had been removed. So then we went to the FBI, and it had been removed from the FBI. Uh, there's somebody within the government has the ability to remove those fingerprints. Only the government can only, do that? Only government people. And uh, that's so, Aaron lies the story. We've got pictures, well, they're debunking, we've got fingerprints that are missing, so. All right, well, now we're into a situation here where we see our own government is suppressing information about these men, not making any attempt to get them out, and in fact, blocking others who are trying to get them out, and there has to be a motive. Now, why don't we get into that? What, what's going on? Well, the motive is, uh, as Senator David Boren, who chairs the Intelligence Select Committee, sees more intelligence than anybody in the country because he chairs that committee. He said January 1st, 1992, that we had to leave more prisoners there than we admitted. He said it was an embarrassment to Nixon, to Ford, to Carter, to Reagan, and now to Bush. And because of that embarrassment, it was passed along. And now it's so embarrassing, we don't want to get them back because it would be a major embarrassment to five administrations. So for embarrassing a few administrations, they're going to let men rot. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's a hard way of putting it, but unfortunately, it, uh, it certainly boils my blood. Well, we'll get them out. Uh, they're going to come home. Uh, not be, uh, in spite of the government, not because of the government, but in spite of the government. Well, we're talking home. about men who have been in, in captivity for 25 years. Uh, yes, and we have one man, even the government today carries as a prisoner, Charles Shelton, shot down in 1965, April 29th, on his 32nd birthday. He's still carried as a prisoner of war as we speak. Now, tell me about your navigator. You flew a plane that, uh, that there were two of you in it. You were the pilot, you had a navigator, and he was a very close friend of yours. So tell me, tell me you, you've recently stated that you think he's still alive. James Kelly Patterson uh, and I flew together as a team for some 18 months. We were shot down in 1967. And after shoot down, he was alive on the ground for four days. He disappeared, but he landed on the ground. I landed on the far side of the mountain range. I was captured the second day, taken to prison, and Pat Kelly Patterson never showed up in the prison system. I learned just a few months ago that in September of 1967, he was flown to the Soviet Union for technical reasons. And I have reason to believe that he's alive in Kazakhstan and the Soviet Union, or now Commonwealth of Independent States. Yes. He is there, and I think he's alive in Terry Menarsen and Jerry Mooney, the national security analyst who testified that they were tracking prisoners going from Southeast Asia to the Soviet Union throughout the war into the mid-80s. And I think uh, Kelly Patterson was one of those men, men that they were tracking. Well, we have a photo of, of you and, and Kelly Patterson. Yes, we do. Uh, it was taken, the photograph was taken as we, got as we made the 75,000th landing aboard the USS Enterprise in 1967, two months before we were shot down. There you are, you're on the right. Yes, and Kelly Patterson on the left. On the left. Kelly Patterson will be 50 years old, has been working as a slave laborer in the Soviet Union for the past 25 years. Now, uh, he was your navigator, so he was more checked out with uh, some of the sophisticated equipment more than just, you, you were the pilot, I don't mean to denigrate the fact that you were the pilot, but uh, he's the kind of man that the Soviets would have wanted more than they wanted you because of his expertise in this electronics. electronics. Well, he was, uh, they felt, you know, it took 42 missiles to shoot down our A6. And the, Vietnam, and the Soviets had put missiles in Vietnam. The same missiles ringed Moscow, protecting Moscow. Since they were not successful in shooting us down, they wanted to know what we had on the A-6 that prevented the missiles from hitting the aircraft. Ah. They all, also wanted to know the sophisticated system of the A-6. I see. Kelly Patterson was a better target because he was smarter in electronics than I was. I was just a pilot, and uh, he was the navigator at the heart of the system. Just imagine, uh, you may see him soon. We I think he, uh, I plan to go to the Soviet Union and find him because my government can't find him. I think I'm going over there because I have a commitment to this man to bring him home. Well, you know, every American has a commitment to this man. So I agree. You're a friend, and, and, and uh, it means more to you. But now, let's get into the subject of live sightings. Now, a live sighting would be somebody who has come out from Southeast Asia and said that he saw Americans, or he saw Caucasians, or he saw somebody that looked like uh, was being held in captivity. Uh, how many of these so-called live sightings by visitors to Vietnam or Vietnam citizens or boat people or something, how many of these have there been? We have over 12,000 live sightings of Caucasians. 12,000? Yes. This is since 1973. Yes. 12,000. Yes. All right, and what has been the government's policy about following up these live sightings? Well, it explained away probably 75% of them, but today we have 1,435 live sightings of groups of Caucasians in captivity. 
And the State Department today will tell you there are 107 cases that meet the litmus test. We tend to believe those 107. If any one of those is true, there are men there. But now we have Pentagon officials that are saying they're there. So we know they're there. It's just that we have to get them home. Because we, in America, if we leave one fighting man or woman in captivity at the end of a war, as we have, we've dishonored this great nation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we have one clipping. I, I think we can get this on screen. This is one clipping where it talks about US POWs as cited in Vietnam, uh, a Japanese monk. Uh, this is from a 1989 newspaper in Massachusetts. A Japanese monk reportedly saw Americans held. This is one of the live sightings. And these kinds of clippings would show up uh, on page 32 of your newspaper or something like that. It was never really much of a deal until, until that photo came out that you released. And we're certainly glad that you released that photo. Well, the monk said he lived with 10 people in 1988, 10 American pilots. He said five of them died from disease and old age in 1988, but five were living when he left in 1989, January 12, 1989. Five months after he, he arrived back in Japan, Sapporo, Japan, the State Department went to Japan to debrief this monk. When they came back, they said, yes, he did live with Americans, but they were not pilots, they were yachtsmen. But they waited five years to go and even ask him about it. Five months after five, he five was, months. yes. So he, that's just one indication. The Tower Commission said they were there. The Gaines Report which, said they were there. Which commission was it? The Thai Commission. Thai. Oh, let's... John Thai headed the agency for four years. Yes. He has said throughout his tenure in DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, that we have enough uh, information to lead us to believe that they're prisoners in captivity. But he said, uh, the, it, it, the report said they were there. It was classified top secret. And a sanitized version was released to the American public that said they're probably there. And that report was hidden from even U.S. senators and congressmen for the next six years. And finally, after uh, Senator Smith, who's now vice chairman of the Intelligence Select Committee, of the, of the POW Select Committee, had the courage to attest that to a bill, and now a senator can see it for the first time. I see. Well, now, <clears throat> we've recently even had Soviets who have come to the United States to tell us about American POWs who were taken from Vietnam and brought to the Soviet Union, which is what we suspect about your, your navigator, Kelly Patterson. Uh, we have a clipping about that, and this occurred in uh, December of 1991. Uh, this clipping talks about the Soviets say that they interrogated uh, US POWs over there. Well, maybe we won't get the clipping up, but anyhow, uh, this was Colonel Kalugin. Uh, General Kalugin, the head of the KGB in 1990 under Gorbachev. Uh, he came to the, to the States and testified that we interrogated three American pilots in Hanoi between 1976 and 1978, three to five years into the war. He said we were trying to recruit KGB agents. I see. So uh, now the Soviets are admitting that there were some men, and, and of course your suspicion is that that's what happened. And to the them. Vietnamese also admitted that the Soviets interrogated American pilots. Well, none of us that came home, 591, were ever interrogated by the Soviet Union. Where are those men who were interrogated by the Soviets? All right. All right, let's move on. I have here uh, a copy of a 100-page report put out by the minority staff uh, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, May of 1991. And it talks at length about the abandonment of American POWs after World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War. It is sickening. It is absolutely sickening. Now, there's one thing that I read through here, and I want to have you comment on it, and that is uh, the fact that uh, Henry Kissinger, as uh, President Nixon's top man to go to the negotiations at the end of the, the war, I don't believe at the time he was Secretary of State. He was uh, a White House uh, National Security Advisor at the time. He went to uh, North Vietnam, and I'm going to read from the report. The North Vietnamese apparently were waiting for the reparations that Kissinger had promised them secretly before the vast majority of American POWs reported by the New York Times were to be repatriated. Doubtless, the North Vietnamese in Pathet Lao, over in Laos, held the prisoners back as human collateral. Human collateral, Red. Kissinger had promised them reparations. And when he didn't even tell Congress that. that, that comes out very clearly. He didn't even inform the Congress of the United States. The Congress of the United States refused reparations. And then these men were held as collateral. 
Comment on that, if you will. Well, it's basic economics. We made a promise to the Vietnamese. We didn't deliver because Congress was not aware of it. They kept collateral, meaning prisoners. And today, our government says they're all dead. So the Vietnamese can't give them back to us because they're dead. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the point here very simply is that our government is not doing what the men in the service deserve. Our government has not been interested in bringing them, these men back. We're thankful to men like Red McDaniel and to a lot of others for their efforts in this regard. The John Birch Society has been publicizing this issue for a long, long time. Even when Red McDaniel was a prisoner, we were uh, pu publishing articles and calling attention to the fact that men had been abandoned and that they were missing and that they were uh, POWs who, who didn't return. We're still at it. And of course, it, this is an issue that reaches right up to the top there are top people in our government that have abandoned the men. And it is, it is absolutely uh, disgraceful. Uh, somebody once said, a government that will abandon its men in uniform is a government that will abandon the whole nation. Unfortunately, it fits. It fits into a problem that our nation faces. Our nation is not being led well. Our nation is being led astray. We have all kinds of documentation to back up what Red McDaniel has said and to introduce you to a greater problem and that being the intention on the part of some of the leaders of our government to lead our nation into a one world socialist system. It's called the New World Order. You've heard that phrase. We don't get into it in this particular interview. We're s simply trying to call attention to one specific problem that exists, that being the subject of the POW MIAs. And we're grateful to Captain McDaniel, first of all, for his willingness to serve in our military, for the agony that he went through, the agony that his family was put through for six and a half years, and for his courage, since he's come out to adopt these positions that he has taken, to stand up to the administrations, to stand up to the forces in government. And of course, uh, it, it is indicative of a much greater problem. That much greater problem is something that the John Birch Society wants to tell you about. And so we'd like you to contact the John Birch Society. Now, Red, you have an organization yourself, and there might be some people who would want to contact you. So tell us quickly well, about people, that. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the prisoner war issue, contact us at the American Defense Institute, 1055 North Fairfax Street. That's 1055 North Fairfax Street, Alexandria, Virginia, 22314. That's Alexandria, Virginia, 22314. And we'll be in touch with you because I think we're approaching critical mass on this issue. And I think with the John Birch Society, the American Legion, the VFW, the DAV coming together, I think we can force our government to change that policy from they're all dead to living and bring them home. Well, thank you very much, Red. We're, we're delighted to have you with us. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we certainly urge you to contact Red McDaniel's organization and to contact the John Birch Society. We thank you very much for listening and we'll look forward to seeing you in our next interview.